you are listening to The Evidence Locker. Our cases have been researched using open source and archive materials. It deals with true crimes and real people. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. It was 2005, a cool December morning on Prestwick Beach in Scotland. A man walking his dog saw someone laying on the beach and went to have a closer look. When he reached the figure, he could see that it was the body of a young woman. Her blonde hair was full of sand and seaweed. She was no longer alive. This woman was 30-year-old Swedish national Annie Boyesen, who had been living in Edinburgh on and off for over a year. But Edinburgh was on the other side of the country. There is an airport in Presswick, and CCTV footage showed that Annie had probably traveled by train, a two-hour journey to reach the airport the day before. However, she never spent more than five minutes there, and the next day, Annie was dead. Her family is haunted by unanswered questions. What brought Annie to Prestwick? And more importantly, how did she die? Although authorities ruled her death as a suicide, her family does not believe that is what happened. This is a case with bizarre secrets, twists, and conspiracies, even theories that involve the CIA. Annie's mother, Guya Boyesen, said, It's like living in an action movie. But we did not choose this. My daughter did not choose this. But we are here. We can't do anything about it. To this day, the circumstances of the death of Annie Boyesen remains one of the biggest mysteries in all of Scotland. Annie Christina Boyesen was born on the 7th of February, 1975, and grew up in the town of Tibro, Sweden. She was one of four children and loved by her family as an outgoing girl who loved having animated conversations about absolutely anything. Annie was a good singer and sang in a band. She would also occasionally play the bass guitar. She loved people from other cultures and had friends from all over the world. She could speak Swedish, English, Finnish, French, and because her father is Hungarian, she was also fluent in Hungarian. She was health conscious, and even if she traveled, she would eat good food. Swimming was her exercise of choice, although she also liked power walking. Annie was tall and slim and had long, waist-length hair. This was something she was very proud of. Her best friend Maria said that she drank aloe vera juice as it was good for her hair. She would also not go to just any hairdresser. Only the hairdresser in Sweden was ever allowed to come near it. Although Annie spoke English rather well, she felt that she wanted to polish her knowledge of the language. In the fall of 2004, she decided to go to Scotland and settled in Edinburgh where she studied English at the Aspect Language School in the center of town. She had traveled to Scotland with a friend in 2003 and fell in love with the country. She loved the lifestyle and interests and felt that Scotland was a place where she could live. That is why she chose to return. She found a room in Linton Court, a block of serviced share apartments on Murrayston Road. It was mostly students or young professionals who lived there, and the location suited Annie just fine. She had two flatmates, whom she did not know before they lived together. She loved meeting, living, and working with people from all over the world. Annie was in her element and adapted to living in Scotland very quickly. The game of rugby was of particular interest to her, as rugby players were exactly her type, athletic and masculine. Whenever there was a game on, Annie would go to Murray Field to support whoever was playing. One of her favorite hangouts was the Murrayfield Warriors Rugby Club. By the end of 2004, her English course was finished and Annie went back home to Sweden. But she was not done with Scotland yet, 
in return for her second stint in February 2005. She was given the opportunity to practice her English by the Scotch Whiskey Experience. The center hosts an interactive exhibition and offers tours of the facility. Located in the Royal Mile in the heart of Edinburgh, it's a popular tourist attraction. Annie worked there for six months, until August when her sponsorship to work at the center ran out. Her job there was to do pop-up performances to entertain guests. Being outgoing and multilingual, Annie was perfect for the job. Sadly, she could no longer work there and had to think about her next move. She went back to her family in Sweden, where she received unemployment benefits. That is not where she wanted to be, and she returned to Edinburgh a couple of weeks later in October of 2005. Her family would never see Annie alive again. On her return to Edinburgh, Annie moved back into Linton Court. She had lived there on and off over the past year and felt comfortable, familiar. Annie applied for jobs in the hospitality industry, but she did not have much luck. While she waited for something to come through, she spent her time sightseeing, power walking, and of course, swimming. She found a leisure center and made a point of going for a swim as often as she could. Annie was close to her mom, Guya, and her friend, Maria, back in Sweden, and kept in regular contact with both of them. She told them what she was up to and chatted about the people she had met. And even though Annie always seemed to be socializing, she didn't have many deep connections in Scotland. She often went out by herself. Her mom and Maria never got the impression that Annie had any best friends. One night, she went out to a nightclub called Mood, again by herself. There. She met a guy who said that his name was Martin Leslie. Annie couldn't believe her luck. Martin Leslie was a rugby player from New Zealand who played for Scotland. Because of Annie's interest in the game, she knew of him and was flattered that he had sought her out. The two of them struck up a conversation and he insisted on buying her champagne. Annie wasn't a big drinker at all and only had one drink, but the animated conversation lasted for most of the evening. As it turned out, the real Martin Leslie was not even in Scotland at the time when Annie met the man posing as him. He had been back in New Zealand for two years by then. Who this mystery man was, and if he ended up stalking Annie, is something that can never be confirmed. In November, Annie's family noticed that Annie was not herself. During some phone calls, everything would be normal. But other conversations were strange. For instance, she once asked her brother if it was possible for anyone to track someone's computer activity. She wanted to know how difficult it would be to hack into someone's computer. She didn't tell him why she asked this, and he didn't ask her about it again. On Sunday, the 27th of November, Annie called her friend Maria in Sweden. They talked for almost an hour. Maria assumed that Annie had made the phone call from Linton Apartments as Annie did not seem at all rushed to end the call. Strangely, there was no record of this call, so it was hard to determine where Annie was at the time. Throughout the last week of November, Annie's behavior was somewhat unusual. She called her family at odd times, like late at night when she must have known that they were sleeping. Many of these calls went unanswered, as they thought they would call her back when they woke up. When her family members tried to return her calls the following day, she wouldn't pick up. No one was too concerned as they knew Annie was busy and always on the run. Sadly, she never had the chance to confide in any of them about what it was that was bugging her. At the beginning of December, as Christmas decorations adorned the streets of Edinburgh, Annie paid her rent at Linton Apartments for a month in advance. She bought a multiple entry card at the local leisure center where she went swimming. She also visited a medical center to receive a vaccination for the winter. There were also some positive responses to her job applications and things were looking up for her. On Wednesday the 30th of November, the man who calls himself Martin Leslie randomly showed up at the leisure center where Annie swam. He was quite out of place and had showed up with the sole intention of seeing her. Annie tried to recall their conversation at the nightclub mood. She must have told him about her swimming then. This incident freaked her out completely. It made her wonder 
if the man was Martin Leslie at all. Although she had seen him play, she would probably not have been able to recognize him up close. Around lunchtime on Thursday the 1st of December, Maria called Annie's mobile phone, but she didn't pick up. Maria knew Annie was busy. She had to go to a work fair, and then she probably went for a swim. She also had plans to go to the Murrayfield Wanderers Rugby Club, her usual hangout. That night, Annie bumped into the man who called himself Martin Leslie yet again, and he bought her a glass of champagne. Annie did not see the drink being poured, so she didn't drink it. Annie was clever that way. She wouldn't take any chances, especially after his appearance at the Leisure Center. It is significant that she felt that she couldn't trust the man. Also, that she had told one of her friends about the incident in an email. The next day, Annie showed up at her old workplace, the Scotch Whiskey Experience, unexpectedly. She chatted with a former colleague, a Norwegian woman called Kat Dalmo, and nothing seemed wrong. Annie was bubbly and chatty, as she always had been. But her demeanor changed when she received a phone call. At 6.15 p.m., her mother called from Sweden. Guya called because she was concerned about Annie. From her conversation with Maria, and even her own conversations with Annie, something didn't seem quite right. She asked her if anything was the matter. Annie said that she couldn't really speak as she was sitting with Kat. Her mother was completely in the dark when Annie made a strange comment. You have to respect this, but I have to take care of myself. Guya had no idea what Annie was talking about and asked if she could call her back later so they could talk a bit more. To this, Annie enigmatically responded, Well, we'll see about that. Guya was baffled, but thought she would hear from Annie soon when they could talk properly. But that would never happen. Less than 30 hours after this strange phone call, Annie would be dead. Scottish authorities would later inform Guyer that there was no record of this phone call on Annie's phone records at all, just like that two-hour call to Maria on the previous Sunday. Another friend called Annie from Sweden, sometime between 6 and 8 p.m. Annie told her she was heading to a party around 10 p.m. and seemed excited about it. Nobody had ever been able to corroborate the story of the party, where it was, who did she go with, how would she get there? Because Annie never drank excessively or ever took recreational drugs, her friend was not worried about her. Annie was street smart and responsible and knew how to take care of herself. This was the last contact any of Annie's friends or family ever had with her. And from here on out, this story takes a couple of bizarre twists and turns. The day after the supposed party, a woman who worked at Linton Court Apartments saw Annie at her flat at 1.15 p.m. This was Saturday the 3rd of December. The employee at Linton Court said that Annie was upset because of a romantic relationship issue, but she didn't want to talk about it. She also overheard Annie saying to another person that she had to take care of something and that she had made a decision that might change her life. Back in Sweden, Annie's family home was being renovated, and her parents and siblings were all preoccupied with the project over that weekend. Guya thought about Annie, but never got around to calling her. Annie's bank records showed that she was at Glasgow Central Station an hour after she was last seen at Linton Court, at 2.15 p.m. CCTV footage confirmed that it was Annie who had used her bank card. The problem with this is, it would take Annie much longer than an hour to make her way from Edinburgh to Glasgow Central Station. Firstly, Annie's apartment was two miles, just over three kilometers from the Haymarket train station, from where she would go to Queen Street Station in Glasgow. And from there, she would have to walk through the city, weaving herself through the weekend crowds just to get to Glasgow Central. There was a theory that Annie had accepted a lift from somebody and went to Glasgow by car. But who would have given her a ride? To this day, nobody has come forward 
and no eyewitnesses saw Annie get into a car outside of Linton Court Apartments. Perhaps the lady at Linton Court who placed her there at 1.15 was mistaken. Perhaps it was earlier. Either way, security footage from Glasgow Central Station shows that Annie visited an ATM and tried to withdraw 100 pounds, but it was declined as there were insufficient funds. She tried again, this time for 50 pounds, which was also declined. Annie did have some cash on her, as well as 300 pounds paycheck. It is strange that she wanted more cash. Her next appearance was filmed by CCTV cameras at Prestwick Airport, an hour later at a quarter past three. Although Prestwick is quite far away from Edinburgh, literally the other side of the narrow country, it was the airport Annie would usually use when she traveled to and from Sweden using Ryanair. At the time, there was not a flight from Edinburgh to Gothenburg. Presswick was about 75 miles, or 120 kilometers, from Edinburgh. So besides traveling abroad, there was no reason for her to have been there. Also, it usually takes 45 minutes to reach the airport by train. Yet according to Annie's bank records, she was at the ATM in Glasgow at the same time, 3.15. There was some confusion as Annie seemed to have been seen at two places at exactly the same time. The station and the airport were 32 miles, or 51 kilometers apart. It was impossible. Then investigators realized the bank transactions were processed via Sweden, where her bank account was held. Sweden is in another time zone, one hour ahead of Scotland. So to keep things clear, Annie was at Glasgow Central Station and tried to withdraw money before she got onto a train for 45 minutes and headed to Prestwick Airport. At 3.15 p.m., CCTV footage showed her walking across the overhead walkway connecting the railway station to the airport. She was smoking as she walked. When her family viewed the footage, they identified Annie's red fleece jumper underneath her heavy winter jacket. Her long blonde hair was tied up in a ponytail. After a short while, Annie was seen going out into the parking lot on the other side of the terminal building. This meant that she must have walked all the way through the terminal in order to reach the exit on the other side. A strange find is that this whole walk took her less than a minute, 55 seconds to be exact. When the Scottish Review reconstructed the walk with someone the same age and level of fitness as Annie, it took 1 minute 32 seconds to get to the other side. The only way to have made it in 55 seconds was if Annie was running. Or, of course, time codes on the CCTV cameras could have been wrong. After three minutes in the car park, Annie went back into the main building. She looked irate and angry. What happened in those vital three minutes? Was Annie supposed to meet someone who didn't show up? She certainly moved in that direction with intention. And if there were someone, had the person just arrived? Or was he or she leaving from the airport? Did they intend to travel together? Either way, after traveling for two hours, Annie only spent just over four minutes at the airport before she left again. The head scratcher is, Annie did not tell anyone about her intended trip to Sweden. It was three weeks before Christmas, so if she had wanted to be home for the holidays, it was still a while to go. There was a flight to Gothenburg at 6.30 p.m. and another one the following morning. But there is no evidence that she had bought a ticket. Maybe she intended to buy a ticket at the airport, on standby to save some money. However, she was not at the terminal long enough to buy a ticket anyway. The only person who knew of Annie's intention to go home was her hairdresser, Inger Nosborn, who had made an appointment for Annie on Monday the 5th of December in Sweden. Later, her flatmates at Linton Court said that some of her personal items were missing, like her toothbrush and makeup, which indicated that Annie must have packed to go away. After the airport, CCTV cameras captured footage of Annie at 4.05 p.m. She was seen walking on a sidewalk on Station Road, a busy dual carriageway heading into Prestwick Town. Night was falling, and the Swedish-born Edinburgh resident was walking towards a town she did not know. 
The next morning, at 8.30 a.m., on Sunday the 4th of December, the dog walker found Annie's body on Prestwick Beach, about two miles or three kilometers from the airport. Police were called to the scene, and they cordoned off the beach. Annie was lying high up on the beach near the Esplanade, about 150 yards away from the flat, shallow bay. The water is about three feet or one meter deep, and it hardly ever washed up as far as the spot where Annie lay. When she was found, she was lying on her back. Her hair was full of sand and seaweed. Her green winter jacket and backpack were by her side. Police were able to identify her from her passport that was in her backpack. Late in the evening of the 4th of December, two local police officers in Sweden knocked on the door of the Borjesen family home in Tibro. They told them the news that no parent ever wants to hear. Guja was shocked and could not understand how her vivacious daughter could no longer be alive. But because of Annie's strange behavior in the days leading up to her death, Guye felt that she was killed. She contacted Scottish police the following day. But even though she speaks very good English, the strong Scottish accent on the other end of the line was difficult for her to understand. She made notes as she spoke, as she wanted as much information as possible. Only when she looked back at the notes did she realize what they had told her. Annie's death was a suicide. That knocked the wind out of Guye. Never. Not Annie. No way. On the beach in Prestwick, police processed the information at the scene where Annie's body was found. In her backpack were two books that had been borrowed from a library in Sweden, again supporting the theory that she was heading home. Strangely, though, her toothbrush and other personal belongings she packed from Linton Court were gone. And most importantly, her filofax was not in her backpack. Annie always had her filofax with her. She kept her money and train passes in it. She would write down names and numbers of people she met and sometimes used it as a makeshift travel journal. She would write down English phrases and funny lines so she could read it later and improve her command of the language. She was also not wearing the red and white fleece jumper seen on the CCTV footage of her at the airport. She had a red t-shirt and blue jeans with a green jacket next to her. Police felt the family could have been mistaken about Annie's fleece, but they were adamant. Annie had bought it in Sweden. The label was Weather Report, and the colors were red and white with a black zipper. To them, it is obvious that she was wearing it underneath her green jacket as she arrived at Presswick Airport. A man saw police on the beach and relayed an incident that had struck him as odd the night before. The eyewitness said, that he and a friend were walking along the promenade around 4.30 p.m. and saw a lone figure on the beach, about 150 yards from the promenade, standing still at the water's edge, staring out to sea. He could not say for certain if the figure was that of a man or a woman, but he said it looked like the person was thinking about taking their own life. He didn't give it a second thought till the next morning when he saw police activity on the beach. That is when he approached investigators and told them what he had seen. His Annie was spotted on CCTV on Station Road at 4.05 p.m. Police were certain she could have made it to the exact place on the beach by 4.30, although it is quite a walk. However, the eyewitness was never asked if the figure he saw resembled Annie or not. Yet the report stated that he said he saw someone fitting the description of the body on the beach. There was no way to say for certain if the person he saw was Annie at all. Annie's family studied all the CCTV footage extensively. It is grainy and of poor quality. They questioned if the person spotted on Station Road was, in fact, Annie at all. The figure could just as easily have been a slender young man, a traveler walking from the airport into town. Annie's body was taken to the Kilmarnock Hospital for an autopsy. It concluded that there was frothy material in her air passages, and there was water in her lungs. At this point, they neglected to test if the water was salt water or fresh water. The report also does not mention if there was sand in her nose or in her ears. There was an injury to her face, 
but they ruled that she must have been lying on something after she was already dead. But remember, when she was found, she was on her back. On the 15th of December, the toxicology results came back, showing that she had a minimal amount of alcohol in her blood. It was even less than the legal driving limit. Annie never did drink a whole lot, but where did she get the alcohol from if it was her who had walked straight from the airport to the beach? Her death was ruled a suicide by drowning with no suspicious circumstances or foul play. After 10 days, on the 16th of December, Annie's body was sent to her family in Sweden. Her family could not believe that Annie would have ended her own life and requested a second autopsy in their home country. When the family learned that Annie's signature waist-length hair had been cut off, they were shocked. It almost looked like it was hacked off in an uneven manner, with two to six inch clumps missing. Her remaining hair was about 25 inches long, still long, but not as long as it was when she was alive. The family contacted Scottish police again and asked if this was done during the autopsy, or if that's how she was found. The autopsy only states that her hair was long, which could mean anything from shoulder length to who knows. The Minister of Healthcare, Anthony Kerr, in a letter to Catherine Styler, MEP, said the undertakers took off between half an inch to an inch. Annie also had more bruises on her body than the initial autopsy disclosed. There was an injury to her right temple, and also bruising behind her right ear. On her right arm were two strange square-shaped bruises, and on her left arm, multiple scratches. The first autopsy ruled that these injuries were caused by something floating in the water. There was also a large bruise to the back of her head, but that was possibly due to the fact that she was found lying on her back. This quote from Forensic Pathology Online. In a dead body lying on its back, blood accumulates in the posterior part of the scalp due to gravity. In advanced decomposition, Due to lysis of red cells and breakdown of the vessels, blood seeps into the soft tissues of the scalp. This appears as confluent bruising and cannot always be differentiated from true anti-mortem bruising. Swedish pathologists also made an interesting discovery. There was freshwater algae found in Annie's bone marrow, and a sample was sent to an expert in Strasbourg for testing. The implication of this was that Annie was probably drowned somewhere else before her body was dumped on the beach. After extensive testing and debating, the conclusion of the algae was that it entered her body because of drinking water. One could wonder if all her time spent in the swimming pool could have had anything to do with this. The family was getting to terms with the lack of investigation into their daughter's death. They strongly felt she was the victim of foul play. They were also certain that Annie's follow facts could have given them a clearer picture of her plans. Perhaps notes or contact details or an appointment at the airport. Police had also not pieced together a timeline of the final hours of Annie's life. She was last seen at the airport. Whether it was definitely her walking on Station Street remained a question. Either way, what happened to Annie that night? Her body was only found after 8 the next morning. The promenade is rather busy with many walkers. Also, there is a busy road next to the beach. Surely, she would have been spotted earlier. Or if she did indeed drown herself, it is not a quiet spot. Someone would have had to have seen her. Besides, suicide by drowning is not extremely common. Less than 5% of suicides in Scotland is due to drowning. Of course, it happens, but it is a very difficult and cruel way to end one's life. Also, it does not have a certain outcome. Interestingly, drowning in salt water takes longer than drowning in fresh water. Drowning in fresh water takes on average two to three minutes, whereas drowning in salt water would take eight to 10. Also, the body's reflexes take over and would make suicide in this manner in very shallow salt water very unlikely. Not to mention the fact that her backpack and her jacket washed up right next to her seems a bit odd. Annie's mother, Guya, knew the password to Annie's Hotmail account, and the mystery deepened further still. It was empty. All the sent and received emails had been erased. 
Now, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, email inboxes usually had limited space. Once an inbox reached capacity, the owner could not retrieve any emails. It would simply bounce back to the sender. Back in the day, it was good practice to keep your inbox tidy by deleting emails after reading them. But even so, one would probably have kept a couple of emails and only deleted ones with large attachments. Annie's family felt uneasy about the missing emails, but tried to convince themselves that Annie preferred using her Filofax. So if emails contained important information, she would have jotted it down and then deleted the email. But when they looked into Annie's phone records, they weren't all that sure. All records of phone calls made or received in the last three days of Annie's life had been completely wiped out. As for the lone phone calls between Maria and Annie, all gone. Even on Maria's records. She contacted the security department at her mobile phone service provider, but they could not give her an answer. Even more strange, on further investigation, they saw that Annie only ever called them from phone booths. She told her family not to call on the home phone at the Linton Court apartment because they might listen. Her family assumed she was referring to her flatmates eavesdropping. But after realizing what extent she went to in order to make phone calls, it made them wonder anew. Who was listening to Annie's phone calls and why? As Maria and Guya gathered more and more information, Maria would start getting phone calls with someone hanging up immediately on the other end. She felt intimidated and scared, but vowed that she would not stop looking for the truth about what happened to her friend. In a case that has more questions than answers, even the strangest conspiracy theories began to carry weight. It came to Annie's family's attention that there was an American journalist by the name of Christina Boryasen. Annie's full name was Annie Christina Boryasen. Christina spelled the same with a K. Their surname is the same, except for Annie's Boryasen that has an umlaut on the O. Could Annie's murder have been a case of mistaken identity? Christina Boryasen, the journalist, had blown the whistle on flight TW-800. The flight exploded minutes after taking off from New York's JFK airport. All 230 passengers died in the explosion. Christina released a thought-provoking documentary in 2013, but she had been researching the incident since 1996. At the time of Annie's death in 2005, Christina was asking uncomfortable questions about the incident that could not be answered by the White House. But perhaps more relevant, she was working on another story too. Seven weeks before Annie's death, Christina Boyesen was in Scotland. She had exposed details of secret CIA rendition flights, transporting terrorists to torture camps via Prestwick. Also, that bombs were manufactured near Prestwick and loaded onto American planes at Prestwick Airport for distribution. When Christina Boyesen asked the U.S. government to comment, they denied everything. Could it be that the CIA killed Annie? thinking that it was Christina in an effort to avoid a scandal? This was an interesting angle, but not very realistic. The American journalist, although also blonde, had shorter hair and was about 20 years older than Annie. If it was supposed to be a hit, the assassin was way off target. Also, to this day, Christina Boyesen is still alive. If she was the intended target, would she not eventually have been killed anyway? When Annie's friend Maria sent emails inquiring about this lead, any and all correspondence would simply disappear from her email account. Someone was watching her online activity, it seemed. And thinking back, one can't help but wonder about Annie's concern about hackers in her phone conversation to her brother a month before her death. As far-fetched as the CIA conspiracy sounds, who else would have the ability to delete emails and phone records? Maria and Guya knew that they could not disregard the theory. If the CIA was involved somehow, it could explain why they've encountered so many obstacles in obtaining information from law enforcement in Scotland. On the family's website for Annie, rockstarannie.com, there is a statement that the family received a clue that Annie's chopped off hair was never thrown away. It is not clear where the hair is. Annie's grandmother posted a reward to anyone who could provide information that would help them in retrieving Annie's hair. In August 2007, 
Annie's family learnt that there was DNA from another woman on Annie's hands. For DNA to have been on her hands, Annie could not have been in the water overnight. She was only in the water for a short time before the traces could wash off. Unfortunately, the Boyesen family does not have any more information about this DNA, as it remains in Scottish law enforcement's hands. They told Guya that they have tested the sample against the Register of Criminals, but had found no match. Guya wonders if Annie perhaps tried to help a woman that was in trouble and ended up in the crossfire, so to speak. Annie often stood up for people and she very strongly believed in right and wrong. For instance, her best friend Maria recalled an incident at Linton Court. House rules stated that residents were not allowed to bring sexual partners home after a night out. One of Annie's flatmates ignored the rule and it upset Annie. So when the flatmate went to a nightclub one night, Annie waited up for her. When the girl came home with the guy, Annie explained to the guy what the house rules were, and he left. The flatmate was furious. Of course, this would not have led to Annie's death, but it showed that Annie did not shy away from confrontation. Today, Annie's case remains closed in Scotland. Scottish authorities stand by their argument that Annie ended her own life. Because of the Freedom of Information Act, no further information about Annie's case has been released as Scottish authorities do not feel it is of public interest. That is why her family in Sweden does not have access to the case file. By 2008, Annie's mother Guya has been to Scotland four times since her daughter's death looking for answers. She went to the official residence of First Minister Alex Salmond with a letter demanding an inquiry into the death of her daughter be opened. She was asked to come inside and was given 30 minutes to state her case. She felt better afterwards and said that although no promises were made, she felt somebody finally listened to her. Meanwhile, Guya and Maria carry on their own investigation, talking to everyone who had spoken to Annie or seen her in the days leading up to her death. They want to know who the mystery man was who posed as Martin Leslie. The real Martin Leslie made an official statement saying that he was in New Zealand at the time of Annie's death. He also had no idea who the imposter could be. Annie's family feels that finding this man could provide many answers. If anyone has any information about the mysterious circumstances surrounding the death of Annie Boyesen in Prestwick on December 6, 2005, please contact the family via the website they've created. Www com. The family is offering Annie's Harley Davidson for any information that would lead to the person who they believe killed their beloved Annie. If you'd like to read more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. Also visit and like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash evidence locker podcast to see more about today's case. If you like our podcast, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We would also appreciate it if you could review the episodes as it gives us some street cred in the world of podcasting. While you're waiting for our next episode, why not listen to one of our podcasting friends? Dumb and busted pop quiz, hotshot. Kay, hit me. A pervy arsonist who has a weird thing for men's shoes. Episode 5, fire starter. Yes. Twins who box for work and murder for fun. Episode 42, cray cray. Yes. Last one. Creepiest creeper who terrorizes a family with handwritten letters. Episode 39, Watch Out. Hell yeah. For true crime stories of insane stupidity and exceptional genius, listen and subscribe to Dumb and Busted on iTunes, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. This was The Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening.